What if I told you the story of humanity is filled with ancient secrets waiting to be uncovered? Today, we're peeling back the layers of time to reveal five incredible ancestors who shaped our destiny. Imagine early bipedal walkers, toolmakers, firemasters, and misunderstood giants with complex societies. From Australopithecus to Homo sapiens, each step in our evolution is a thrilling chapter in the epic saga of human survival and ingenuity. Are you ready to embark on a journey through time and discover the secrets of our origins? Let's dive in. In 1942, the scientific community was thrown on its head when Raymond Dart, an Australian anatomist and paleontologist, made a groundbreaking discovery in Taung, South Africa. Unlike most discoveries that involved immense experiments and even more outlandish theories, Raymond's discovery was rather small but its implication would change the course of history quite literally. Raymond received the fossilized skull of a young child from a limestone quarry worker named Joseph Motletle. This fossil wasn't your average child skull and would come to be known as the Taung child or Taung baby. It belonged to a never-before-known species, later named Australopithecus africanus. But what was Australopithecus? Why were they important? Who is Lucy? And how did the discovery of a single, complete fossil change the timeline of the world's history? Australopithecus is a genus of extinct hominids that lived in Africa from about 4.2 to 1.2 million years ago. Considered to be one of the earliest hominin, or human-like primates, these creatures were characterized by a combination of ape-like and human-like features. These included having a small brain size, projecting faces, large jaws with powerful chewing muscles, and, to the shock of the whole science community, the ability to walk upright on two legs, bipedalism. Compared to the average human, these creatures had relatively long arms and fingers, a trait they most likely kept from their ancestors, who just a few million years ago still swung from tree to tree. Since Raymond discovered the Taung child, hundreds of sites across eastern Africa and South Africa's Sturkfontein and Makapanschat caves have unearthed numerous fossils, representing several unique species of Australopithecus. These caves are now renowned sites for the study of early hominins. However, the fossils discovered at Sturkfontein were not just important for anatomical studies, but also presented an additional twist, as multiple species of Australopithecus were found within them. These species included Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus robustus, However, the caves weren't the only source of scientific breakthrough, as in 1974, the famous Lucy fossil, an Australopithecus afarensis specimen, was discovered in Ethiopia by Donald Johansson and Tom Gray. Found in the Afar region of Ethiopia, in a site known as the Hadda Formation, Lucy is one of the most complete Australopithecus skeletons ever found, and was an instant scientific breakthrough, as she gave us detailed insight into the early hominins' locomotion and anatomy. When it comes to anatomy, the Australopithecus, which by the way means southern ape, is quite a fascinating species as it blends both ape-like features and somewhat human features. According to research and fossil records, the Australopithecus was small and slender, typically between 1.2 and 1.4 meters tall. The same study also found that there was probably a difference in size between males and females, with males possibly being up to 50% larger than females. However, not everyone believes this, as scientists today are not entirely sure, because most of the fossil evidence available is incomplete. According to researcher A. Zillman, there was a physical likeness between Australopithecus and bonobos, an endangered species of pygmy chimpanzee found mainly in Africa. His research suggested that the Australopithecus had similar body proportions and size to the bonobos. However, the similarities don't stop there. Additional models of how the Australopithecus regulated body temperature indicated that they likely had abundant body hair, similar to chimpanzees and bonobos. This hair would have aided the Australopithecus in maintaining a stable body temperature, unlike modern humans, who typically have less body hair and rely on other methods for thermoregulation. Much like today's humans, the Australopithecus had 32 teeth, with their teeth being a mix of old and new features. But perhaps the strangest thing about the species' dentition is how unique it is. See, their canines were smaller and less connected, more like ours, and they had four low rounded bumps called cusps for crushing food, similar to ours. However, 
Their molars were also parallel, like those of great apes, and they often had thicker enamel compared to other apes. To make things more unique, their teeth were stronger than other apes, with some species having very worn down back teeth. So, what did they use these teeth to eat? According to research, the Australopithecus species likely had a varied diet, mainly consisting of fruits, vegetables, and tubers like yams. However, that might not have been all they ate, as new evidence claims that the ancient apes may have also eaten easy-to-catch animals, like small lizards. Besides this, some studies suggest that some Australopithecus species may have consumed meat occasionally. This is primarily because they had larger front teeth, indicating they might have needed them for tearing food, perhaps even scavenging meat, though most evidence points to a primarily plant-based diet. Besides their teeth, their body shapes, which included their large bellies and the position of their sagittal crest, further support the idea that they were adapted to a diet rich in plant food, with their front teeth processing most of the food they eat. Besides having a diet and dentition that bore an eerie resemblance to ours today, the Australopithecus also had a trait that baffled scientists for years to come, and it all boiled down to how they moved around. When it comes to getting around, the Australopithecus took the entire science world by storm, and this was all due to one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever, the Laetoli footprints. Discovered in 1978 by a team led by paleontologist Mary Leakey, the Laetoli footprints are a set of fossilized footprints discovered in Tanzania, East Africa, dating back approximately 3.6 million years. Left behind by Australopithecus, the footprints were found preserved in volcanic ash deposits at the Laetoli site. The site itself is located near the Old Duvai Gorge, a renowned paleoanthropological area rich in hominin fossils. These footprints were all the rage in the scientific community, as they offered a fascinating glimpse into the past, providing tangible evidence that Australopithecus walked on two legs, an essential milestone in the story of human evolution. But why was this such a huge deal? Well, a majority of the controversy surrounding this finding came from conflicting evidence and interpretations in early hominin evolution. See, initially, it was thought that large brains preceded bipedalism, but discoveries like Australopithecus fossils with small brains challenged this idea. Essentially, scientists were left to debate whether bipedalism was an adaptation to specific environments or inherited from common ancestors. Besides the major controversy surrounding the footprint discovery, the setting for the discovery itself was equally intriguing. See, after a volcanic eruption millions of years ago, the ground was covered in ash. Following the eruption, there was rainfall that not only marked the land, but also mixed the ash into a slurry. It was in this unique combination of volcanic residue and rain-formed indentations that the Australopithecus ventured, leaving behind a trail of footprints that would endure for millions of years, giving us clues about how Australopithecus moved. Moving forward, the examination of these footprints reveals a striking similarity to our own. This is because when Australopithecus walked, their heels made initial contact with the ground, followed by the rest of the foot. As such, the deep imprints from their big toes showed they pushed off strongly with each step, and the arches in their feet helped them move efficiently. The ability to walk with two feet was a game-changer for these ancient apes as scientists think it gave them some advantages, such as freeing up their hands so they could carry things or babies while walking. Also, standing tall may have helped them see over tall grass and spot food or dangers ahead. However, the transition to bipedalism was not without its challenges. Compared to their quadrupedal counterparts, the Australopithecus may have been slower in their movements, and the adoption of an upright posture may have placed additional strain on their bodies potentially leading to issues such as back pain or other musculoskeletal problems, much like those of an elderly person today. With key sites located in the Great Rift Valley, South African caves, and the Chad Basin, the Australopithecus species presents itself as one of the most fascinating, as across different species they exhibit variation in morphology and behavior, reflecting adaptations to different environments and lifestyles. In fact, some lineages, such as robust Australopithecans, show cranial facial adaptations for processing a vegetarian diet, while others exhibit tooth reduction, brain expansion, and even the use of tools. In addition to the anatomical variation, Australopithecus species likely exhibited diverse behavioral adaptations in response to their respective environments. In fact, the presence of stone tools associated with some Australopithecus fossils 
actually suggests an early capacity for tool manufacture and use. These tools may have been used for processing plant foods, accessing animal carcasses, or even for defense against predators. But regardless of their use, the variability to use tools was a discovery that left researchers around the world confused and excited, especially when you consider the fact that the ecological diversity of Australopithecus is reflected in their geographic distribution and habitat preferences. Essentially, fossil finds indicate that Australopithecus species inhabited a range of environments, including woodlands, grasslands, and even more open savanna habitats. This ecological flexibility and their ability to use tools were also a pointer to a much bigger discovery. The Australopithecus was evolving into a homo, the genus of the modern human. As a hallmark of the transition, the development of more sophisticated tool use and technological innovation was revolutionary. While Australopithecus species utilized simple, stone tools, early Homo species showed evidence of more refined toolmaking techniques and the use of diverse tool types for various purposes. Essentially, we can see the tools getting more sophisticated as the apes evolved. But there's more, as this change was also biological. The transition from Australopithecus to Homo was not a sudden event, but rather a gradual process, spanning millions of years. Fossil discoveries, such as those of Australopithecus afarensis, show intermediate features that bridge the gap between Australopithecus and Homo. For example, Australopithecus afarensis exhibits bipedal locomotion, similar to later Homo species, suggesting an early stage in the evolution of our genus. But by far the biggest evidence of this transition is the morphological changes observed in the fossil record. These changes include increases in brain size, alterations in tooth morphology, and shifts in body proportions. For instance, compared to Australopithecus, early Homo species exhibit larger brains relative to body size, reflecting an expansion in cognitive capacity and possibly the emergence of more complex social behaviors. But that's not all as changes in tooth morphology, such as reductions in tooth size and robustness, suggest shifts in dietary patterns and food processing techniques. Although complex, these adaptations may have been driven by changes in habitat, resource availability, or social dynamics, indicating the evolutionary flexibility of early Homo populations. Another confounding sign of the evolutionary flexibility of the Australopithecus is a trait found in their kids a trait that very closely mirrors that of today's babies. See, the Australopithecus, much like many early hominins, exhibited a unique pattern of brain development. And one significant aspect of this development was the slow growth of the brain during childhood. This was very strange, as unlike some other primates whose brains grow rapidly during infancy, the Australopithecus brain showed a slower pace of growth. This slower growth is quite important, as it is believed to reflect a prolonged period of learning and cognitive development during childhood. Essentially, this pattern suggests that Australopithecus infants had a greater capacity for learning and adapting to their environment as they grew. It meant their brains had more time to absorb information, acquire skills, and develop cognitive abilities essential for survival in their environment. As such, this prolonged period of brain growth likely contributed to their ability to navigate complex social dynamics, acquire toolmaking skills, and adapt to changing environmental conditions. But that's not all, as the Australopithecus kids bear more resemblance to today's kids. Research has also shown that the Australopithecus babies likely had larger eyes and heads compared to adults. It is believed that this aided in learning and social interaction. But that's not all because, like the younger kids of today, they also had increased joint flexibility, which would have been great for exploration. However, as they grew, their joints grew too, becoming specialized for upright walking, leading to a loss of early flexibility. Acting as the proverbial Bigfoot of the human evolution tree, Australopithecus is a treasure trove for researchers worldwide, as this long extinct ape continues to bridge the gap in our environmental knowledge, pushing the boundaries of what we know. However, not everyone believes these ancient apes to be part of our ancient family tree, as many researchers claim the fossil record and genetic evidence suggest that Australopithecus is not a direct ancestor of modern humans, but rather a close relative that inhabited Africa alongside early Homo species. In the late 1950s, renowned paleoanthropologists Lewis and Mary Leakey 
made a discovery that would forever change their lives and the face of science. Nestled in the ever-popular Olduvai Gorge, amidst the rugged terrain of Tanzania, the couple unearthed the fossilized remains of a never-before-seen species. Unknown to them, they had discovered one of the earliest members of the human family. Named Homo habilis, this species would shock the world as it turned science on its head and redefined what it means to be a part of the human family. But what exactly do they look like? Why was their discovery so controversial? And, in an extremely shocking twist, how did a set of fossils 2.4 million years ago help us understand how we use tools today? Found in the Olduvai Gorge of Tanzania, a region popular for the discovery of hominin fossils, the Homo habilis was discovered in the early 1960s by Kenyan-British paleoanthropologist and archaeologist Louis Seymour Bazet Leakey and his wife, British paleoanthropologist Mary Douglas Leakey. Although discovered in the early 1960s, the story of the Homo habilis discovery actually started many years before. See, starting in the late 1930s, Lewis and Marie Leakey discovered the remains of many extinct animals, including the 25-million-year-old Proconsul primate. This is one of the first ancient ape skulls ever found as a fossil. However, during that period, the couple would also begin discovering stone tools in Olduvai and other places. However, as they searched, their work at Olduvai Gorge was briefly stopped by political problems in nearby Kenya. But luckily, they returned in the late 1950s. While interested in ancient tools, they became increasingly curious about the people who made them. And in the early 1960s, they found what they were looking for. On the morning of the discovery, Lewis was feeling unwell at camp, and so Mary ventured out alone to continue their search for fossils. While exploring the area, Mary came across some intriguing fossilized remains near Bed 1 of Olduvai Gorge. Among these fossils, Mary noticed something different, a set of bones that appeared to belong to a previously unidentified hominid species. These bones included a lower jaw, two skull fragments, and several bones from the hands and feet, catalogued as OH7. These remains, dating back to about 1.75 to 2.1 million years ago, suggested mind-blowing features that distinguished them from other known hominid species, leading Mary to believe that she had discovered a new and significant find. Upon further excavation and analysis, the Leakeys determined that these fossils represented a new species of early human, which they named Homo habilis, meaning handy human, due to the fact that they suspected these species to be responsible for the stone tools they had previously found. Years of research and excavation would follow, with more and more fossils being unearthed. And finally, the Homo habilis was accepted as its own species after Leakey's son Richard, in 1972, discovered another Homo habilis, often called Turkana boy, or ER-1470. The fossil dated to 1.9 million years ago and helped solidify the belief that Homo habilis was not only part of the human family tree, but also one of the oldest on the tree. And, more interestingly, one of the first human ancestors to use tools, which today is a significant milestone in human evolution. Today, fossils attributed to Homo habilis have also been found at Hadar, Ethiopia, Kubifora, and Kenya. So, what did the Homo habilis look like? When it comes to Homo habilis, there was a lot to discover, leaving many scientists puzzled for years. For example, Homo habilis is believed to have exhibited sexual dimorphism. This essentially means that there was a difference in size depending on whether they were male or female, with males being bigger and heavier. In fact, males were believed to stand at around 5 feet 2 inches and weigh in at approximately 114 pounds, while comparatively smaller females stood at about 4 feet 1 inch and weighed around 70 pounds. Besides size, the Homo habilis also exhibited a dynamic blend between the earlier Australopithecus and the hominins that followed until the humans we see today. Like the proverbial Bigfoot of the science community, the Homo habilis was a sort of bridge connecting the two and foreshadowing the evolutionary developments to come. When compared to the Australopithecus genus, the shape of Homo habilis's skull, face, and teeth was more delicate suggesting an evolutionary leap forward. However, that wasn't the only surprise discovery, as their teeth were similar to ours, suggesting they might have changed their diet and even started cooking food. 
Moving on from the skull, the Homo habilis's bones also show in depth just how they adapted to their environment and developed new skills. For example, their long arms suggest they still spent time in trees like their ancestors, but their hands were great for making and using tools because they could grip well. Besides that, changes in their hip and neck bones also suggest they faced challenges during childbirth, so their bodies adapted to make it easier. Speaking of adapting to the environment, what kind of environment did the Homo habilis evolve in? Homo habilis was not confined to one location, but ranged across different regions of Africa. Although initially found in places like Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, their remains have been discovered at various East African sites, such as Kubifora in Kenya and Ethiopia. To make things even crazier, evidence suggests they might have also inhabited sites in South Africa, like Sturkfontein and possibly Swartkrans. The leading theory is that around 2.5 million years ago, climatic changes in southern Africa likely prompted Homo habilis, or its ancestors, to migrate northward toward the East African Rift Valley. This theory stands mainly because the Olduvai Gorge, where Homo habilis once lived, resembled today's Serengeti, with savanna grasslands interspersed with scrub, bushes, and some woody plant cover. Forced to move, the Homo habilis likely interacted with their environment in various ways. While there's no direct evidence of living structures at Olduwan sites, it's speculated that Homo habilis, being adept climbers, might have slept in trees to avoid predators on the ground. At the time, Homo habilis shared their world with other species, including Australopithecus africanus, Homo rudolfensis, Paranthropus boisei, and even Homo erectus, although the nature of their interactions with each other remains uncertain. Moving from South Africa to East Africa not only affected their way of life, but also what they ate. See, the Homo habilis diet was diverse, consisting of insects, grass-eating animals, fruits, and even meat. Thanks to their fossils, their teeth showed signs of chewing tough and fibrous foods, indicating a versatile diet. Cut-marked bones also suggest they were skilled hunters or scavengers. The discovery of the Olduwan industry, the oldest known stone tool industry associated with Homo habilis, provided additional insight into their behavior, as evidence suggests that they concentrated stone material and animal bones at certain locations. These concentrations could indicate the presence of home bases or central foraging areas. But that was not all, as the use of stone tools would have increased their independence from their environment and may have led to the development of cultural practices. While the use of fire and language among Homo habilis remains speculative, evidence of burnt bones and fire-cracked stones at Olduwan sites hints at the possibility that Homo habilis might have used fire. However, whether this was deliberate or the result of natural causes like lightning strikes remains uncertain. Similarly, the development of a proto-language or communication system among Homo habilis is unclear with no direct evidence yet discovered. However, their tool-making abilities suggest cognitive complexity and the potential for cultural evolution. Some scientists also believe that, like kids today, Homo habilis kids had to be taught social norms and survival skills. Their claims are backed up by the fact that Homo habilis was the first species to exhibit enlarged brokers and Wernicke's areas, which are the cortical areas specialized for the production and comprehension of human language. As such, it's completely plausible that they possessed the motor control necessary for increased tongue movement and the ability to understand the sounds they could produce as a result. For the Homo habilis, an important trait to their survival and classification into the human family is the adaptive prowess that lies in their technological innovations, notably in the Olduwan tool industry, dating back approximately 2.6 to 1 million years ago. Initially identified by the Leakeys in the 1960s, the Olduwan tools are primarily associated with Homo habilis, but they also overlap with other Homo species, like Homo rudolfensis and Homo erectus, as well as with later Australopithecans. These tools, mostly made from broken rocks, changed how early humans worked, helping with tasks like cutting up big animals. They included different types, like choppers, polyhedrons, and discoids, made by hitting rocks together or using them as hammers on other rocks. While the specific function of these tools remains speculative, cut marks on animal bones provide insights into their use for processing carcasses of diverse sizes, 
from small mammals to large mammals like elephants. But in a surprising twist, recent discoveries at Dikika, Ethiopia, and Lomekwi, Kenya, have pushed back the origins of stone toolmaking to approximately 3.3 to 3.39 million years ago, predating the emergence of the Homo genus. Moving on from hunting, there has been additional evidence of architectural structures, such as rock piles, dating to 1.75 million years ago, suggesting that there were rudimentary construction practices among early Homo populations, further highlighting their adaptive ingenuity in prehistoric landscapes. But how was this ancient species so sophisticated? Well, their constructive and technological prowess was primarily due to their brains and how they functioned. Thankfully, we know this because new studies examining the endocranial casts of Homo habilis from Olduvai Gorge have shed light on the brain's evolution in early hominins. Compared to other East African hominids, Homo habilis is quite exciting as it exhibited a significantly larger endocranial capacity surpassing even the mean size of Australopithecan species by a substantial margin. This expansion in brain size, quantified through various metrics like Gerson's NC and EQ and Hemmer's CC, represents a remarkable, rare genetic trait of HOMO, signaling a disproportionate enlargement of the brain. Further analysis of their brain size and structure has revealed significant transverse expansion of the cerebrum, particularly in the frontal and parieto-occipital regions, accompanied by increased volume in the frontal and parietal lobes, a distinctive characteristic observed solely in Homo. Besides this, the endocasts of a Homo habilis exhibit a unique pattern of grooves and ridges in the frontal lobe, similar to what is seen in later Homo species and humans of today. The Homo habilis also showed notable development of the inferior parietal lobule, a feature that is also found only in the Homo family. Essentially for its time, the Homo habilis brain was essentially an evolutionary tank, slowly evolving and learning in ways that not only reflect who we are today, but also the significant evolutionary journey it took to get to us today. With that said, the question stood, how did this evolutionary brain affect their behavior, mannerisms, and culture? And what was its evolutionary implication? The evolution of Homo habilis's brain had significant implications for their behavior mannerisms, and culture. With the expansion and development of their brains, the Homo habilis likely experienced advancements in cognitive abilities, including problem-solving, communication, and tool use. This could have influenced their social interactions, allowing for more complex relationships and cooperative behaviors within their communities. Furthermore, the enlargement of specific brain regions, such as the frontal and parietal lobes, may have contributed to the development of unique skills and behaviors. For example, the enhanced development of the frontal lobe associated with decision-making and social cognition might have led to more sophisticated social structures and cultural practices. But that's not all, as the prominence of the inferior parietal lobule would have facilitated spatial awareness and contributed to their ability to navigate their environment and create more elaborate tools. Essentially, in terms of evolutionary implications, the evolution of a larger and more complex brain in Homo habilis marked a significant milestone in hominin evolution. It represented a shift towards greater cognitive complexity and adaptability, enabling Homo habilis to thrive in diverse environments and exploit new resources. This evolutionary advancement laid the foundation for subsequent species within the Homo genus leading to the emergence of even more sophisticated tool technologies, social structures, and cultural practices. Essentially, their brains laid the foundation for who we are today. But then, with such a title attributed to the species, the new question stands. Why is its inclusion in the Homo family tree debated? To understand why the Homo habilis place in the Homo family tree is disputed, first we need to look at what it means to be in the Homo family in the first place. The classification of Homo habilis within the Homo family tree is a subject of debate due to its complex mix of characteristics and transitional features. Essentially, some researchers argue that it shares traits with both earlier Australopithecus species and later Homo species, making its classification challenging. One point of contention is the significance of its anatomical features, particularly its brain size. While Homo habilis has a larger brain size than Australopithecus species, it falls below the traditional threshold for inclusion in the Homo genus, based on brain size alone. 
This discrepancy raises questions about the criteria used to define Homo species. But that is not all, as ongoing discoveries of new fossils and advancements in anatomical methods continuously reshape our understanding of human evolution. As more evidence emerges, interpretations may change, leading to ongoing debates and revisions in the classification of Homo habilis within the broader context of human evolutionary history. To grasp why Homo habilis's place in the Homo family is disputed, it's essential to first understand the criteria for belonging to the Homo genus. From the perspective of Homo classification, species within the genus typically exhibit certain key traits, including increased brain size, the use of tools, and potentially more complex social behaviors. However, Homo habilis presents a challenge because its characteristics do not neatly fit into these criteria. One factor contributing to the debate is the variability observed within the fossil record attributed to Homo habilis. Different specimens show variations in cranial morphology, dentition, and limb proportions, leading to questions about whether these differences represent intraspecific variation or multiple distinct species. Moreover, the interpretation of tool use and cultural behaviors associated with Homo habilis is subject to interpretation. While stone tools are often found in association with Homo habilis fossils, the extent of their toolmaking abilities and the sophistication of their cultural practices remain uncertain. Additionally, the discovery of new hominin species and the refinement of dating techniques have challenged previous hypotheses about the evolutionary relationships between different taxa. As a result, the placement of Homo habilis within the Homo genus continues to be re-evaluated in light of new evidence and theoretical frameworks. Ultimately, the debate surrounding Homo habilis underscores the complexity of human evolution and the need for interdisciplinary approaches to address questions about species, classification, behavior, and evolutionary relationships within the Homo genus. Essentially, the handyman of prehistoric times was a whole lot more than a walking ape. Standing as our oldest ancestor, the Homo habilis has proven to the world how long it took to get to where we are today. Walking the Earth around 1.5 to 1.9 million years ago, Homo erectus is perhaps the most fascinating of our ancestors. Emerging from the humble tree-climbing and occasionally upright-standing Homo habilis, these ancient humans were the first to truly resemble modern man sparking a sense of kinship across the ages. But it wasn't just their appearance that set them apart. They also laid the foundations of our civilization by harnessing the elements and understanding their own biology. From feats like taming fire to the early development of language, these prehistoric pioneers are the silent architects of our existence. But who were they? What did they look like? And how did they think? And perhaps most importantly, how did these ancient wanderers craft the very foundations of the society that we continue to weave today? To uncover the answers, we must journey back in time, to an era where the spark of humanity first ignited, and man first learned how to harness the earth and his mind. In 1891, Dutch anatomist and paleontologist Eugene Dubois set out on an expedition to the Dutch East Indies, present-day Indonesia, hoping to find the missing link in human evolution. See, the missing link theory emerged in the 19th century during the early days of evolutionary theory. It referred to a hypothetical extinct creature that bridged the evolutionary gap between modern humans and their primate ancestors, particularly the modern chimpanzees. See, the big idea was to find fossil evidence demonstrating the transition from apes to humans, and everyone was out to find it. But what Eugene would come to find would be more than he ever expected. Driven by the conviction that the origins of humanity could be traced back to the tropics, an idea inspired by the distribution of modern primates and early human fossils, Eugene set out for adventure and chose the island of Java as his primary focus. With its rich geological layers and ancient deposits, Java at the time seemed like not just a promising location, but the best possible location. And luckily, after years of painstaking exploration and excavation, his efforts paid off in a region called Trinil, along the banks of the Solo River. In October 1891, Dubois' team unearthed a fossilized skullcap, popularly known as Trinil II, that had distinct features unlike those of modern humans or known apes. They had found it, a piece of the proverbial missing link. 
this skullcap had a prominent brow ridge, a low sloping forehead, and a brain size intermediate between that of apes and modern humans. After a lot of study a year later in 1892, they found a thigh bone nearby that further supported the idea that this was a bipedal species. Dubois named his find Pithecanthropus erectus, which means upright ape man. However, this discovery was later reclassified as Homo erectus, fitting into the broader human evolutionary tree. Although human evolution is now seen as a branching process rather than a linear, Eugene's discovery would open the gate to a finding that would change everything we knew about ourselves. Many years after Eugene Dubois unearthed Java Man at Trinil in the 1920s and 1930s, a series of finds known as Peking Man were made at Zhukudian near Beijing, China. These fossils included several skulls and bones and provided substantial insight into the Homo erectus species. In 1984, Kamoya Kimu changed the game as he discovered the nearly complete skeleton of a young male, known as Turkana Boy, near Lake Turkana, Kenya. This find offered valuable information about the physical structure and growth patterns of Homo erectus, and still continues to this day. Additionally, the Dmanisi fossils found in the 1990s in Georgia included several skulls and jawbones, showcasing significant variation and expanding our understanding of early human migration. Although at the time not much was known about the species, one thing was clear, they were definitely something special. The Homo erectus first appeared on Earth approximately 2 million years ago during the Pleistocene Epoch. During this period, these new species of ancient man marked a significant evolutionary step that still baffles scientists today. See, unlike their predecessors, the Homo habilis, who still spent time in trees, the new Homo erectus had a fully upright posture and was adapted to living primarily on land. Contrary to what you would believe, the Homo habilis were not extinct during the emergence of Homo erectus and would hypothetically have interacted with their ancestors as they both tried to navigate the changing world together. Dying out just around 108,000 to 117,000 years ago, the Homo erectus set the precedent for multiple human achievements. And perhaps one of the most important is that they were the first species to wander out of Africa. Conquering new lands and spreading across the globe, these ancient wanderers initiated a new way for mankind, one that would directly lead to more subspecies in the human family tree, specifically Homo heidelbergensis and Homo antesor. Due to their wandering, Homo erectus is believed to be a direct ancestor of Homo heidelbergensis, which lived in Europe and Africa around 700,000 to 200,000 years ago. Homo heidelbergensis, in turn, is considered to be an ancestor of both the Neanderthals, aka Homo neanderthalensis, popularly known as cavemen, and the modern humans of today, the Homo sapiens. Besides, the Homo heidelbergensis is another descendant of the Homo erectus, and its wandering is the Homo antecessor, primarily found in the Iberian Peninsula. This species, however, is different from Homo heidelbergensis, as it exhibits a mix of archaic and modern traits, indicating a transitional form between Homo erectus and later Homo species. But what led to the evolution of Homo erectus? Well, to understand this, we have to look at the isolation theory. The theory reasoned that geographic and environmental barriers played a crucial role in the speciation and evolution of Homo erectus. According to this theory, a population of Homo habilis became isolated due to physical barriers such as mountains, rivers, or deserts. And as such, over time, natural selection acted on this isolated population, leading to adaptations that eventually differentiated them significantly from their ancestors. This theory is backed by fossil records that indicate that Homo habilis and Homo erectus actually coexisted for a period, suggesting a gradual evolutionary process. As such, the lack of geographic isolation in various regions like Africa and Asia facilitated the emergence of distinct traits in Homo erectus populations, contributing to their eventual divergence from Homo habilis. Sadly, after conquering the world for more than 1.5 million years, the Homo erectus populations gradually declined and eventually disappeared. With the last known population existing on the Indonesian island of Java, known as Homo erectus soloensis, Astonishingly, this group persisted until about 108,000 years ago. When it comes to the demise of Homo erectus, several factors can easily be pointed to as the culprits. 
One significant factor was climate change, the transformation of open woodlands into tropical rainforests in some regions, created environments less suitable for Homo erectus, ultimately leading to their decline. But that was not all, as the emergence of more advanced Homo species, such as Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, led to increased competition for resources, further contributing to the decline of Homo erectus. Sadly, despite their adaptability, Homo erectus faced limits in surviving drastic environmental changes and competing with more advanced hominins, and those that did not evolve into new species or adapt quickly enough eventually perished. But what exactly made them last so long? How did they survive the world and not only survive, but stand as an apex predator? When it comes to looks and somewhat human anatomy, the Homo erectus was the first ancient human to look anything like the modern human of today. So much so that you could dress one up and have them walk down the street undetected. Of course, that would be after a small application of makeup here and there to help the ancient wanderer look more like us and less like a member of the uncanny valley. The Homo erectus was quite a marvel to scientific society as it exhibited a range of anatomical and behavioral traits that marked significant evolutionary advancements, advancements that still stick with us today. Standing fully upright and completely adapted to walking and living on the earth, the Homo erectus bipedal posture offered them the necessary requirements for their migratory lifestyle, allowing them to walk long distances and conquer new lands. Typically standing between four and six feet tall, Homo erectus individuals had a robust and muscular build with thick bones and strong muscle attachments that indicated a life filled with physical demands. In actuality, Homo erectus had a wide range of body sizes, similar to modern humans. They varied in height from about 4 feet 9 inches to 6 feet 1 inch and weighed between 88 and 150 pounds. These differences were likely due to variations in climate, mortality rates, or nutrition across different regions. However, unlike other great apes, there doesn't seem to have been a significant size difference between Homo erectus males and females, although there isn't much fossil evidence to confirm this. This potential lack of sexual dimorphism was a shocker. As if the Homo erectus didn't show sexual dimorphism, they might have been the first in the human lineage to lack this trait. The Homo erectus had limb configurations and proportions similar to those of modern humans, suggesting human-like walking and running abilities. This theory is supported by footprints found near Illoret, Kenya, that show a human manner of walking. They also had shoulder structures that could allow for high-speed throwing. Initially, it was thought that the Turkana boy fossil had a different number of vertebrae compared to modern humans, but later findings confirmed he had a human-like spine curvature and the same number of vertebrae. Moving on from skeletal structure, the timeline for when human ancestors lost most of their body hair is unclear. Genetic analysis suggests that dark skin, which protects against UV radiation, evolved around 1.2 million years ago, possibly indicating the development of hairlessness around that time. This change might have been necessary for survival in environments with high solar radiation. It is thought that early Homo species, living in lower and hotter regions, might not have needed body hair for warmth as much as their Australopithecine ancestors, who lived at higher, colder elevations. As such, the Homo erectus populations in higher latitudes might have developed lighter skin to prevent vitamin D deficiency. In fact, one specimen from Turkey, dating back 500,000 to 300,000 years, had the earliest known case of tuberculosis meningitis, a condition worsened by vitamin D deficiency in dark-skinned individuals living in higher latitudes. Hairlessness in Homo erectus is generally thought to have helped with sweating, reducing parasites, and possibly sexual selection. Facially, the Homo erectus featured prominent brow ridges and a sloping forehead, giving them a distinctive profile, a profile that would be edited over the years by evolution to give us what we now know as the human face. In the mouth region, Homo erectus had jaws that projected outward more than those of modern humans, accommodating larger teeth suited for a diet of tough, fibrous plant material and meat. Their dental enamel was the thinnest of any Pleopleistocene hominin. While this thin enamel prevented their teeth from breaking when eating hard foods, it made it harder to shear through tough foods, and as such, their diet had to be adapted to combat this. 
The jaws of Homo erectus, like all early Homo species, were thicker than those of modern humans and living apes. This thickness helped them resist the twisting forces from biting or chewing, allowing their jaws to handle powerful stresses while eating. However, the mandibles of Homo erectus were somewhat thinner than those of early Homo species. Their premolars and molars showed more pitting than those of Homo habilis, indicating a diet that included more brittle foods. These dental traits suggest that the Homo erectus mouth was less suited for processing hard foods and better adapted for shearing tougher foods, likely due to their use of tools. But perhaps their most notable anatomical development was their projecting nose an adaptation that helped humidify and warm inhaled air and, as such, ensured they survived in varied and often dry climates. An alternative hypothesis proposed by American psychologist Lucia Jacobs suggests that this projecting nose allowed Homo erectus to distinguish between the direction of different smells, allowing them to better navigate the ancient world and travel long distances. In terms of brain size, the Homo erectus had a capacity ranging from approximately 600 to 1,100 cubic centimeters, averaging around 900 cubic centimeters. This was a substantial increase from their predecessors, although it remains smaller than the average modern human brain, which is about 1,350 cc's. The cognitive abilities of Homo erectus also evolved over time, as early populations had brains that ceased developing at a younger age limiting their capacity for learning and adaptation. However, later Homo erectus populations showed signs of continued brain development into later stages of youth, similar to modern humans, allowing for enhanced learning and adaptability. This enhanced learning and adaptability would then lead to some remarkable discoveries by the species. But we'll talk about that soon. Today, recent studies have shown that the brain size of the Asian Homo erectus over the last 600,000 years is quite similar to that of modern humans. In fact, when comparing brain sizes, some present-day human populations actually have brain sizes that overlap more with the Homo erectus than with modern humans, who have bigger brains. Essentially, this research points out issues with our current understanding of how brain size has evolved as it doesn't take into account differences between populations. The average brain size of Homo sapiens has increased mainly because the largest brains have gotten bigger, while the smallest brains haven't changed much compared to Homo erectus. This increase is more noticeable in northern populations, likely due to body size and climate factors. Because of these brain size similarities, some researchers suggest that Asian Homo erectus could be classified as a subspecies of Homo sapiens, called Homo sapiens soloensis, as earlier researchers had initially proposed. Another mind-boggling fact about the Homo erectus is that they most likely possessed a sort of proto-language, meaning they had more complex communication than any of the earlier hominids. However, they did not have fully formed speech, Scientists believe in this emerging communication ability most because of the discovery of a hyoid bone, which is a small U-shaped or horseshoe-shaped solitary bone situated in the midline of the neck, anteriorly at the base of the mandible and posteriorly at the fourth cervical vertebra. This bone supports your tongue, plays a key role in speaking and swallowing, and as such, suggests some vocal communication was possible. When comparing Homo erectus to modern humans, several differences stand out. For example, modern humans have flatter faces, less pronounced brow ridges, and larger brain sizes. Our bodies are lighter, with thinner bones, and less pronounced muscle attachments, reflecting a less physically demanding lifestyle. However, these differences are simply a polished and better evolved version of those found in Homo erectus. Essentially, the Homo erectus represents a crucial step in human evolution with significant advancements in anatomy and behavior. But why did they evolve as they did? What was their environment like? And how did their diet affect this evolution? Let's find out. First appearing on the open plains and savannas of Africa around two million years ago, Homo erectus is one of the most successful and widespread early human species, exhibiting remarkable adaptability to diverse environments and dietary sources. Their existence spanned several million years, during which the dynamic climactic shifts of the Pleistocene Epoch profoundly influenced their lifestyle, migration patterns, and survival strategies. For example, 
glacial and interglacial periods caused significant changes in global climates, leading to shifts in habitats and the availability of resources. These changes forced Homo erectus to migrate, adapt, and innovate continuously. Heading back to Africa where it all started, Homo erectus emerged from environments rich in large herbivores and dangerous carnivores. This environment presented both significant opportunities and challenges. This is because the vast grasslands teemed with game, providing ample hunting opportunities, while the woodlands and forested areas offered shelter and diverse plant foods, creating a mixed habitat that supported a varied diet. As Homo erectus migrated out of Africa, they encountered the mixed forests and open plains of Europe. These regions required different strategies, as Northern Europe, with its colder climates and mountainous regions, demanded adaptations to withstand harsher conditions, leading to a completely different set of evolutionary traits and even the prospect of construction. More on that later. As they moved on to Asia, Homo erectus adapted to an even broader range of environments, as the tropical rainforests and open woodlands in Southeast Asia provided a lush but challenging habitat, teeming with new flora and fauna. Plains and wetlands in India and China presented different ecological niches, requiring Homo erectus to be versatile in their tool use and dietary habits. Essentially, driven by the need to find suitable habitats and resources, Homo erectus migrated across vast distances as they moved out of Africa into Europe and Asia, adapting to diverse environments along the way. This extensive migration led to the development of distinct regional subspecies, such as Peking man in China and Java man in Southeast Asia. So what did they eat? The Homo erectus is often considered one of the first human species to truly embody the role of apex predators. This is because they were proficient hunters and hunted large mammals like antelopes, swine, rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, and even elephants. They were able to do this thanks to their advanced stone tools, which included axes, knives, pickaxes, and cleavers, which were essential for hunting and butchering large game. In addition to meat, Homo erectus had a diverse plant-based diet. In fact, archaeological evidence from Israel indicates they consumed over 50 different types of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. This varied diet suggests a sophisticated understanding of their environment and the nutritional value of different food sources. Essentially, for survival, their ability to gather and process plant foods was crucial, especially in regions where large game was scarce. While the development of sophisticated tools allowed Homo erectus to exploit a wide range of food sources, the true game changer was the invention and use of fire, as it marked a revolutionary step in their evolution. See, being the first human to actually harness fire, it not only provided warmth and protection, but also enabled the cooking of food, which improved its taste, nutritional value, and safety. Cooking made certain plant foods edible and more digestible, allowing Homo erectus to expand their dietary repertoire. Continuing the train of the Homo erectus changing our views of human evolution, it is believed that the Homo erectus had a more advanced and structured lifestyle compared to their predecessors. This is because they are most closely associated with the Acheulean stone tool industry, which was a stone tool industry of the Lower Paleolithic period that included hand axes, cleavers, picks, and early forms of stone knives. This stone tool industry was known for making tools that were chipped on both sides to create sharp edges, with the most common tool being an almond-shaped hand axe made of flint about 8 to 10 inches long, with the entire surface flaked to create cutting edges. These tools were essential for cutting, scraping, and processing meat. In later populations, particularly in Java, the Homo erectus even used bowlers made from string and stones to capture prey. But the stone tools were not their most impressive feat, as the Homo erectus was the first to harness and control fire. They used fire for warmth, light, protection from predators, and cooking food, which made it easier to digest and safer to eat. Evidence from sites in Kenya suggests they transported fire from natural sources to their settlements, using materials that burned slowly and learning to create sparks by striking rocks together. Essentially, the ability to use fire was a revolutionary step that had significant implications for their daily lives and even ours today. But once again, they didn't stop there. 
as the Homo erectus also tried construction. Some Homo erectus built basic dwellings using simple structures made from branches, rocks, and mud. These shelters, found in Europe and Africa, provided protection from harsh weather and may have been used seasonally, particularly in colder regions. The construction of these dwellings indicates an understanding of the need for shelter and a capacity for planning and cooperation, a skill set we still use today, albeit in a better capacity. Moving on from shelter, although clothing's exact origins are uncertain, scientists have dated them to have existed at least 3 million years ago during the Homo erectus era. Evidence of head and body lice divergence around 170,000 years ago suggests clothing was used even before modern humans left Africa. It is believed that animal hides were likely among the earliest materials used. And that's not all, as Homo erectus possibly engaged in seafaring as early as 1 million years ago, as evidenced by artifacts in Indonesia. Besides that, the Homo luzonensis, living on Luzon Island, Philippines, 771,000 to 631,000 years ago, indicates early maritime capabilities. Evidence also suggests that Homo erectus practiced rudimentary healthcare. For example, a specimen of Homo erectus gorgicus, who had lost most of their teeth due to age or gum disease, survived for several years, possibly with assistance from other group members. The Takana boy even had spinal disc herniation, which likely caused lower back pain and restricted movement, yet he still survived into adolescence. Regarding art and rituals, there are indications that Homo erectus may have engaged in symbolic behavior. Engraved shells and beads, as well as the possible intentional collection of red-colored pigments like okra, suggest a level of creativity and aesthetic sensibility. However, interpretations of some artifacts such as the Venus of Tantan are debated, with some suggesting they represent early attempts at representing human forms. Walking the Earth between 130,000 and 40,000 years ago, the Neanderthal is perhaps the most famous species of hominin known to man. From movies to songs and books, their popular persona as cavemen is no new concept. However, who really were the cavemen? Were they as dumb as the media says? And how is it possible that you might have a little caveman DNA in you? Stay tuned to find out. The Neanderthals were the first species of fossil hominin ever discovered, and since their initial discovery, they have grown in popularity, holding a place in the collective minds of science lovers and non-science lovers as the oh-so-popular cavemen. First found in 1829, they were not initially recognized as a possible human ancestor until the second half of the 19th century, when more fossils were discovered. Since then, Thousands of incredible fossils representing the remains of many hundreds of Neanderthal individuals have been unearthed from sites all across Europe and the Middle East. These remarkable discoveries include the remains of babies, children, and adults up to around 40 years old. Thanks to these findings, we now know more about this fascinating human ancestor than any other in history. The earliest known Neanderthal remains were discovered by the Dutch-Belgian prehistorian Philippe Charles Schmerling in 1829 in what is now called the Schmerling Caves in Belgium. There, he found a child Neanderthal skullcap named Engis II, along with other skeletal remains that puzzled him. Unable to find a suitable answer, Schmerling believed the remains belonged to a poorly developed human buried alongside extinct animal species. In 1848, the Gibraltar One skull was discovered in Forbes Quarry by Lieutenant Edmund Henry René Flint and presented to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. Initially, it was thought to be a modern human skull, and its significance as an archaic human was not recognized until later. Years later, the most famous and pivotal discovery occurred in 1856 in the Neander Valley, near Dusseldorf, Germany. There, quarry workers found bones that included a cranium, thigh bones, and parts of a shoulder blade and ribs in the Kleiner Feldhofer Grotte. Upon seeing the bones, local school teacher Johann Karl Fulrod recognized the bones as distinct from modern humans and presented them to the German anthropologist Hermann Schaffhausen for study. In the end, Schaffhausen and Fulrod concluded that these bones represented an ancient form of human distinct from today's contemporary populations. The species was named Homo neanderthalensis meaning human from the Neanderthal Valley. Following the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859, 
Fulrot and Schaffhausen argued that Neanderthals were an ancient form of modern humans. However, their work met significant opposition, notably from pathologist Rudolf Virchow, who insisted the remains represented diseased modern humans, rather than a new species. Virchow's erroneous interpretation delayed broader acceptance of Neanderthals as a distinct species until the end of the 19th century. By the early 20th century, numerous Neanderthal remains had been discovered across Europe, solidifying their classification as a legitimate species, Homo neanderthalensis. A key discovery that helped this was the discovery of La Chapelle or Saints I, also known as the Old Man in France. Following its discovery, French paleontologist Marcelin Boulet authorized detailed studies on the specimen, and although his work helped the Neanderthal to be accepted as a species of its own, his reconstruction was wrong, as he depicted Neanderthals as slouching and ape-like, reinforcing the image of them as primitive and distant from modern humans. Sadly, the 1912 Piltdown Man hoax further misled researchers by presenting a more modern-looking human ancestor which seemed to support Boulay's depiction. Despite Boulay's influential but inaccurate portrayal, other scientists began to challenge this view. For example, Scottish anthropologist Arthur Keith in 1911 reconstructed La Chapelle O Saints I as more human-like, with tools and cultural artifacts. And although Keith's interpretation did not gain immediate acceptance, it laid the groundwork for future re-examinations. Thankfully, in the end, the exposure of Piltdown Man as a hoax and the re-examination of La Chapelle aux Saints I, whose slouch was due to osteoarthritis, led to a more nuanced understanding of Neanderthals as intelligent and capable, with behaviors and cultures similar to those of modern humans. Today, the Neanderthals are typically classified as Homo neanderthalensis, though some consider them a subspecies of Homo sapiens. Overall, Neanderthals are now seen as a complex and intelligent species, as ongoing research keeps refining our understanding of their place in human evolution. But that's history. The next question should be, what kind of environment would force our closest relatives to evolve as they did? Our closest ancestors, the Neanderthals, evolved and thrived in a world that was anything but stable. The period from about 65,000 to 25,000 years ago, known as OIS-3, was marked by rapid, severe, and abrupt climate changes that had extremely profound environmental impacts. Sadly, despite being physically adapted to cold conditions, the Neanderthals faced extreme and unpredictable shifts in their environment within their lifetimes, leaving little time for their populations to recover. It was this same unstable climate that played a crucial role in their evolution and eventual extinction. Due to their environment, the Neanderthals had to develop a wide range of survival strategies to cope with the extreme conditions. Archaeological records show that they lived in small, mobile groups, which allowed them to exploit different resources and move away from deteriorating conditions quickly. However, the dramatic climate changes of the OIS-3 period would continue to have significant impacts on Neanderthal populations. This is because the harsh conditions at the time caused many local populations to dwindle or die out entirely, making it difficult for Neanderthals to sustain themselves over long periods of time. As time went on, humans adapted, as even small advantages in biology, behavior, or lifestyle could mean the difference between life and death. As the Neanderthals struggled, modern humans arrived in Europe and had a wider range of adaptations, which may have given them a competitive edge over the Neanderthals. Interestingly, evidence suggests that the replacement of Neanderthals was not solely due to direct competition with modern humans as severe climate conditions made Europe inhospitable for all human populations living there, leading to widespread population declines about 30,000 to 28,000 years ago. However, modern human populations in Africa survived and later recolonized Europe, while Neanderthals, who were not present in Africa, sadly became extinct. The evolutionary history of Neanderthals is complex and intertwined with the broader human lineage. They are thought to have evolved from Homo heidelbergensis, a common ancestor shared with modern humans and Denisovans, before populations became isolated in Europe, Asia, and Africa. The Neanderthals developed distinct features over time, marked by periods of gradual change and adaptation to their environment. In fact, fossils dating back to around 450,000 to 430,000 years ago already show distinctive Neanderthal dental features, indicating the early stages of their evolutionary path. 
as to how they evolved. Two main hypotheses explain their evolution, namely the two-phase model and the accretion model. The two-phase model suggests that a major environmental event, like the Sali glaciation, which was a significant ice age during the Middle Pleistocene epoch, caused rapid changes in Neanderthals. According to this model, first, their body size and robustness increased quickly to adapt to the cold. Then, this initial adaptation was followed by further anatomical changes, helping them survive in those harsh conditions. On the flip side, the accretion model proposes a slower, gradual evolution, divided into stages, each reflecting adaptations to specific climatic conditions. The Neanderthals and Denisovans, another species of humans, are more closely related to each other than to modern humans, suggesting that their split occurred after their common ancestor with modern humans. Genetic studies estimate the Neanderthal Denisovan split around 473,000 to 381,000 years ago, likely before hominins spread across Europe. These early populations, sometimes referred to as Neanderthovans, may have interbred with even earlier human species already present in Europe. Essentially, Neanderthals evolved in a challenging and changing environment that shaped their physical and cultural adaptations. Their interactions with their environment, coupled with their biological and behavioral strategies, were largely successful because of their resilience and adaptability, two traits that truly define what it means to be human. However, the severe and abrupt climate changes ultimately played a significant role in their decline and extinction, paving the way for modern humans to become the dominant human species. So what did these cavemen look like? When it comes to looks and anatomy, the Neanderthals possessed a distinct anatomy tailored for survival in their environment. Their bodies were generally shorter but more robust compared to modern humans, with males averaging around 168 centimeters or 5.5 feet and females slightly shorter at 156 centimeters or 5.1 feet. The Neanderthals' robustness extended to their muscular build, as they were heavier and more muscular than their modern counterparts. But that was not all as their brain size was notably larger than that of modern humans, averaging around 1,500 cubic centimeters. This brain size was likely a result of their heavier and more muscular physique, as well as adaptation to cold climates. The distinctive shape of their skull featured a long and low profile, with a rounded brain case, a prominent occipital bun at the back, and a depression for strong neck muscles. The Neanderthals also had thick brow ridges beneath a flat and receding forehead, and their mid-face projected forward, giving them a distinctive facial appearance. Their jaws were larger and lacked a projecting chin, with teeth that were larger than those of modern humans. They also had robust limb bones with large joints, indicating strong musculature in their arms and legs. Their shin bones and forearms tended to be shorter than those of modern humans, which is typically an adaptation to cold climates. The pelvis of Neanderthals were also wider from side to side, potentially affecting their posture. But that was not all. Genetic studies of the species shocked the world, as they provided insights into Neanderthal adaptations and characteristics, including their unique metabolism, hair, and skin color. According to the studies, they likely matured faster than modern humans, had higher basal metabolic rates due to their muscular build, and were more active in dim light conditions. The Neanderthals had lighter skin to adapt to low sunlight levels, and genetic analysis suggests they may have had a range of hair and eye colors, including red hair and even fair skin. Keeping with the theme of being human, the Neanderthals were not without their health challenges, showing evidence of injuries, infectious diseases, and genetic disorders. In fact, traumatic injuries were common, with a high percentage of specimens showing signs of healed major trauma. But that was not the only problem for the species, as inbreeding may have led to low genetic diversity and increased susceptibility to birth defects and diseases. Disturbingly, there was also evidence of lead exposure in the fossils that suggested there were life-threatening environmental challenges at the time. In order to understand what the Neanderthals ate, we first have to examine their oral hygiene, or more aptly, lack thereof. It should go without saying that the Neanderthals didn't have toothbrushes, this seems obvious, seeing as they were cavemen, but this singular fact was a stroke of luck for today's scientists. See, the lack of prehistoric dental hygiene resulted in teeth gunk that would not only shock your dentist, but also contain a goldmine of information on their diet. 
But what makes teeth gunk so important and valuable? Well, without regular brushing, a thin sticky film made from proteins and microbes forms on the surface of teeth, known as dental plaque. Over time, plaque hardens to form tartar or dental calculus, composed of calcium phosphate minerals with occasional magnesium or iron. This very process is what gives them their value. As encased within the hard mineral crust, tiny bits of microbial and food matter can be preserved for thousands or even millions of years. Thanks to these bits, scientists can examine the teeth to determine the species of microbes and the types of food Neanderthals consumed. For instance, DNA from dental calculus in Neanderthal teeth found in the spy cave in Belgium revealed that they ate meat, specifically woolly rhinoceros and wild sheep. However, for the Neanderthals, this is no one-size-fits-all diet, as what they ate varied by region. For example, in the El Cidron cave in Spain, dental calculus showed a more plant-based diet, including mushrooms, pine nuts, moss, and tree bark. Essentially, the Neanderthals were not exclusively meat eaters. Astonishingly, the dental calculus also provides insights into Neanderthal health and medicinal practices. For example, one Spanish Neanderthal had a dental abscess, and carried the DNA of Enterocytosune bianusi, a gastroparasite. This individual also had DNA of poplar bark, which contains salicylic acid, the active ingredient in aspirin, and traces of penicillium mold, suggesting possible self-medication with natural painkillers and antibiotics. Bacteria encased in dental calculus also do a little more, as they reveal information about Neanderthal microbiomes, See, the Neanderthals had Methane Brevibacter oralis, a bacterium also found in human mouths, indicating potential saliva exchange between species. Essentially, the moderns might have kissed, or at least shared food with the Neanderthals. A genetic analysis of Methane Brevibacter oralis in Neanderthals revealed that the ancient versions lacked genes for antiseptic resistance and certain sugar digestions. This basically tells us that Neanderthals had different diets and hygiene practices compared to modern humans. Their diets were less rich in processed sugars, and they didn't use antiseptics, which over time led to evolutionary changes in oral bacteria. As human diets evolved and hygiene practices became more sophisticated, our oral microbiomes adapted, reflecting the ongoing interplay between human evolution and our microbial companions. Now that we know what they ate, the new question is how they live their lives, and how it mirrors ours today. When it comes to Neanderthals, their way of life was like anything before, and by far strongly showed us the primitive version of who we are today. The Neanderthals likely had the neurological capacity for speech, as evidenced by the presence of the FOXP2 gene, which is a crucial gene for language development. But that's not all, as they also possessed a hyoid bone, which is a U-shaped bone in the neck that supports the tongue and closely resembles that of modern humans. This suggests they could produce a range of sounds similar to those used in human speech, essentially facilitating complex communication. Perhaps one of the most shocking things about the Neanderthals is that they demonstrated a variety of cultural practices. They engaged in burial rituals, indicating a possible belief in an afterlife or spiritual world with intentional burials often including grave goods, such as tools and animal bones, pointing to a ritualistic or at least symbolic behavior. Besides believing in religion and having burials, the Neanderthals showed an exemplary mastery of a fire. See, fire played a crucial role in the lives of Neanderthals, significantly impacting their survival, social structures, and technological advancements. Essentially, their mastery of fire enabled them to thrive in diverse and harsh environments. For example, fire allowed Neanderthals to cook food, making it more palatable, digestible, and safer by killing pathogens. This enhanced their nutrition and supported their robust physiques. Additionally, the fire provided essential warmth during glacial periods and in cold regions, improving comfort and extending their habitat range. It also served as a deterrent against predators and possibly hostile groups, ensuring safety at night. In terms of technology, Neanderthals used fire to improve their tools as heat treatment enhanced the quality of stone tools, making them sharper and more effective, while fire-hardened wooden spears became more durable for hunting. Beyond its practical uses, fire was a focal point for social gatherings, facilitating communication, storytelling, and planning hunts. Overall, 
Fire was indispensable to Neanderthal life, shaping their dietary habits, technological progress, and social cohesion. Speaking of hunting, it was a vital aspect of Neanderthal life, essential for sustenance and survival. See, Neanderthals were skilled hunters who used a whole array of tools and strategies to capture prey effectively. Their hunting techniques likely involved both solitary and group efforts, as they employed ambush tactics, stalking, and even persistence hunting, where they would chase prey over long distances until exhaustion. Owing to their robust physique and endurance, coupled with their knowledge of terrain and animal behavior, the Neanderthals were not just hunters, but formidable hunters. To hunt, the Neanderthals crafted sophisticated tools, including spears, javelins, and stone-tipped wooden weapons. They also used sharpened stones and wooden clubs for close-range combat. Today, evidence suggests that they hunted a wide range of animals, including large game like mammoths, bison, and deer, as well as smaller prey such as rabbits and birds. Successful hunts provided Neanderthals with essential protein and fat, supporting their high-energy lifestyle and enabling them to thrive in challenging environments. But that wasn't all as hunting also fostered social cohesion within Neanderthal groups, as cooperation was necessary for effective hunting expeditions. In fact, evidence suggests they engaged in cooperative behaviors within their groups, such as caring for injured individuals and sharing resources. Besides hunting, the Neanderthals also faced competition from Homo sapiens and other predators, which eventually shaped their survival strategies. In the realm of art, it is believed that Neanderthals engaged in symbolic and artistic activities. They created cave art, including abstract shapes, handprints, and animal depictions. They also had personal ornaments made from bones, shells, and teeth, as well as body decoration and art made from natural pigments like okra. The Neanderthals were also believed to have enjoyed music, as it is believed they used simple musical instruments crafted from bone or wood to produce rhythmic sounds that resonated within their communities. These musical expressions could have served social, ritualistic, or even communicative purposes. The Neanderthals, much like us today, also saw the necessity of clothing as they fashioned garments from animal hides and furs, tailored to suit their needs in diverse environments. For them, clothing also served as a form of expression, reflecting individual and group preferences while contributing to a much larger social identity Essentially, the Neanderthal's life was a complex interplay of group dynamics and environmental conditions. This was also evident in how they dealt with other species, as today, their intergroup relations have shed light on the complex social dynamics of Neanderthal communities. While they likely had territorial boundaries and occasional conflicts, evidence also suggests cooperation and cultural exchange between different groups, as trade networks may have facilitated the exchange of goods, ideas, and genetic diversity, contributing to the resilience and diversity of Neanderthal societies. This intercoordination did not stop there, as the Neanderthals were also believed to have mated with our direct ancestors. Genetic evidence indicates that Neanderthals and Denisovans interbred with each other, as well as with early Homo sapiens populations, as they migrated out of Africa. This interbreeding, however, was a blessing and a curse as it resulted in the exchange of genetic material between these hominin groups. Today, genetic studies reveal that up to 2.4% of non-Sub-Saharan human DNA originates from Neanderthals, while even individuals with Sub-Saharan ancestry carry traces from later Eurasian migrations. Today, the Neanderthal genes we carry have bestowed upon us both advantages and disadvantages, as some genes honed over 300,000 years of Neanderthal evolution bolster our immunity against local Eurasian pathogens, while others promote fertility and protect against miscarriage. However, some traits, like increased pain sensitivity and susceptibility to certain diseases, may have negative consequences in the modern world. For instance, Neanderthal DNA has been linked to conditions like Viking's disease and autoimmune disorders. Moreover, certain genetic variants increase the risk of severe illness from diseases like the infamous COVID-19, essentially showing us that the complex legacy of our ancient relatives still very much plays a huge part in shaping our health and molding our future. In the end, our closest ancestors are exactly what we call them, as they displayed a lifestyle and adaptation that figuratively and genetically continued to live in us. From appearance, 
to lifestyle, they were the first to truly show what it meant to be human. And it's upon their legacy that we stand today and have built our society. But try as we all might, there is no denying that we all have a little caveman inside us. First appearing 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens today stands as the most impactful and advanced species to walk the Earth. From evolutionary advancement like no other, to intelligence that can put a man on the moon, it will surprise you to know that the world's most sophisticated species is nothing more than an amalgamation of their ancestors' best traits and millions of years of evolution. But what does it truly mean to be a Homo sapien? How did our ancestors shape the world today? And what does it truly mean to have humanity in your veins? Known for their unmatched intellectual prowess, the name Homo sapiens quite literally translates to wise man or wise human. Standing as the latest species of the human race, Homo sapiens should not be a foreign concept to us. After all, it's who we are and the species all 8 billion of us belong to. But how did we get here? What makes us who we are today? And what exactly are our origins? To truly understand the origin of our species, we need to first pay homage to those who came before us. See, humans belong to the superfamily Hominoidea, which generally includes all apes. However, the lineage leading to humans began diverging from that of other apes millions of years ago. First splitting from gibbons, then orangutans, and later gorillas, the final split between human ancestors and the ancestors of chimpanzees and bonobos occurred around 8 to 4 million years ago during the late Miocene epoch. A significant genetic event in this period was the fusion of two ancestral chromosomes in humans, resulting in 23 pairs of chromosomes, unlike the 24 pairs in other apes. Following the split from chimpanzees and bonobos, the hominin lineage diversified into several species and genera. Among the New World, the earliest known genera was Australopithecus, which included species like Australopithecus afarensis, who lived between 4 and 2 million years ago and displayed both ape-like and human-like traits. The genus Homo, we believe, evolved from Australopithecans around 2.8 million years ago, with the earliest known fossil being the specimen LD350-1 from Ethiopia. According to mainstream archaeology, early species such as Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis appeared around 2.3 million years ago, characterized by larger brains and more sophisticated tool use. Around 2 million years ago, Homo erectus emerged, becoming the first archaic human to leave Africa and spread across Eurasia. Thanks to evolution, the Homo erectus had a more modern body plan, a larger brain, and a greater capacity for complex toolmaking and the use of fire which significantly impacted their survival and social structures. The Homo sapiens of today evolved in Africa around 300,000 years ago from a species commonly known as either Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rodensiensis, who were descendants of the Homo erectus that remained in Africa. The development of Homo sapiens involved several critical adaptations, most notably cognitive and behavioral modernity. And around 160,000 to 70,000 years ago, early Homo sapiens began to exhibit advanced behaviors such as sophisticated language, art, and complex social structures. Today, Homo sapiens can be found in every corner of the Earth and sit at the top of the food chain worldwide. But this fact presents a question. If the species began in Africa, when, why, and how did they spread across the Earth and conquer it? At the very core of the topic, the out-of-Africa migration of Homo sapiens occurred in at least two major waves, shaped by environmental changes, technological advancements, and the quest for new resources. The first wave took place around 130,000 to 100,000 years ago. This initial migration saw early humans moving into the Middle East and parts of Asia, likely driven by changing climate conditions and the search for more hospitable environments. Fossil evidence from Israel's Shkul and Kavze caves, dating back to this period, supports this early movement. It's important to understand that during this period, the Homo sapiens shared the Earth with many different ancient human species, such as Neanderthals, Denisovan, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, and Homo naledi. As such, these early groups that migrated did not establish long-term populations, possibly due to competition with local archaic humans 
or unfavorable environmental conditions. The second wave, known as the Southern Dispersal, occurred around 70,000 to 50,000 years ago. During this period, Homo sapiens utilized advancements in toolmaking and developed new survival strategies that facilitated their migration. This wave of migration followed coastal routes through South Asia and Southeast Asia, eventually reaching Australia about 65,000 years ago. Thankfully, this migration was more successful in establishing lasting populations, as evidenced by widespread archaeological sites and genetic evidence. As mentioned before, as the Homo sapiens expanded out of Africa, they encountered local populations of archaic humans, such as Neanderthals in Europe and Western Asia and Denisovans in Asia. These encounters often led to interbreeding. In fact, genomic studies have revealed that modern humans outside of Africa carry small percentages of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA. According to the study, non-African populations possess approximately 1-2% to Neanderthal DNA while some Melanesian and Southeast Asian populations carry up to 5% Denisovan DNA. Although it might seem irrelevant, this interbreeding and interaction with other hominins were significant in shaping modern human genetics. The genetic contributions of Neanderthals and Denisovans have influenced various aspects of modern human biology, such as immune system responses and adaptation to different climates. So now we understand when they migrated out of Africa and what happened next. However, the next question, and possibly the bigger one, stands as to why they did it in the first place. Well, the reasons for these migrations are quite many, but one of the largest contributors was environmental pressure, such as changing climates, which may have created more favorable conditions for migration during certain periods. Besides that, technological advancements such as improved toolmaking and the use of fire provided early humans with the means to adapt to new environments and exploit new resources. As they say, curiosity killed the cat, but in our case, it forced us to grow. Although it might sound weird, seeing as we are all Homo sapiens, our species is not without its own share of fossils. See, the fossil records for Homo sapiens are a literal gold mine for archaeology, paleobiology, and so many other fields, as they provide an intricate and enlightening narrative of our evolutionary history, showcasing a wide array of significant discoveries. Ironically, unlike every other human species, Homo sapiens did not have a true type specimen. This essentially means there is no specific individual designated as the archetype for the species. To understand why, we have to look no further than when Carl Linnaeus first named our species Homo sapiens in 1758. See, scientists at the time didn't use type specimens, which, by the way, are specific examples meant to represent a species. In 1994, paleontologist Robert Bakker jokingly suggested using the skull of Edward Drinker Cope, a famous paleontologist, as the type specimen. Cope donated his body to science when he died in 1897, and his skull is kept at the University of Pennsylvania. However, for a specimen to be a true type specimen, it must have been examined by the person who first named the species, which means Cope's skull doesn't qualify. Although we don't have a designated type specimen for Homo sapiens, we do have an extensive record of fossils that reveal the world of our ancestors and how we evolved over the millennia. Among these fossils, one of the most influential is the Marbocranium. The fossil records of Homo sapiens provide a fascinating and detailed narrative of our evolutionary history. Each significant discovery sheds light on the physical, cognitive, and cultural development of our species, showcasing a wide array of traits and adaptations that illustrate our journey from archaic hominins to modern humans. Discovered in 1958 near the village of Maba in Guangdong Province, southern China, the Maba cranium consists of a skull cap and parts of the right upper face, including the bones of the nose. The fossil had pronounced brow ridges similar to those of Homo erectus, but indicated a larger brain capacity, although precise measurements are impossible due to the incomplete skull base. Dated to approximately 130,000 years ago, the Marbocranium is classified as an archaic Homo sapien, or an Asian extension of Homo heidelbergensis. This classification was a big deal, as it bridged features between Homo erectus and modern humans, illustrating an important transitional phase in human evolution. Moving to another fossil, the Cro-Magnon remains were discovered in 1868 in a cave at Cro-Magnon near Le Aziz de Tayac, France. 
These early Europeans had a robust build, a prominent chin, and a brain capacity of around 1,600 cubic centimeters, which is somewhat larger than the average for modern humans. The Cro-Magnons produced sophisticated tools and remarkable art, dating from around 10,000 to 45,000 years ago. Essentially, they represent early Homo sapiens in Europe and showcase advanced cognitive and cultural development, including the famous cave paintings of Lascaux and Altamira. See, these artworks, along with decorated tools and weapons, essentially showed us that the Cro-Magnons had developed complex symbolic thought and cultural practices, much like the people of today. Another major fossil was the Steinem skull, found in 1933 along the Mur River near Stuttgart, Germany. The fossil had a cranial capacity of approximately 1,100 cubic centimeters and exhibited a mix of archaic and modern traits, including a long, slightly flattened skull, moderately heavy brow ridges, and a rounded rear portion. Dated to approximately 350,000 years ago, the Steinem skull is classified as either archaic Homo sapiens or Homo heidelbergensis and is extremely important as it gave scientists a wonderful insight into the evolutionary transition in Europe from early hominin to modern humans and the morphological changes that occurred during this period. As you've seen in some of the fossils, a good amount of the Homo sapien fossil record is often lumped with other species, and this isn't surprising as our species is simply the amalgamation of the best traits of our ancestors. And one of the best ways to see this is in the Solo Man fossils. Discovered in the early 1930s at the Solo River in Ngangdong, Java, the Solo Man fossils consist of 11 skulls and two leg bone fragments, with cranial capacities ranging from 1,150 to 1,300 cubic centimeters, characterized by thick bones and heavy brow ridges. The fossils showed signs of complex social or ritualistic behavior as their skull bases were broken, suggesting the heads might have been taken as trophies and the brains eaten. But that wasn't the major concern as these fossils, possibly dating to the late Pleistocene around 15,000 to 20,000 years ago, sparked debate about their classification as some scholars considered Solo Man a late Homo erectus, specifically the Homo soloensis while others believe Solo Man is a regional variant of early Homo sapiens. Although many fossils are not attributed to Homo sapiens with 100% accuracy, some are, and among them are the famous Omo fossils. The Omo fossils, discovered in 1967 in the Omo Valley, Ethiopia, include Omo 1 and Omo 2, and show a mix of modern and archaic features. The Omo 1 had a more modern appearance, with a high cranial vault, while the Omo 2 had more robust features. Dated to approximately 195,000 years ago, these fossils are among the earliest known Homo sapiens and are extremely important as they reinforce the African origin of our species. But that's not all, as these findings have been crucial in understanding the timeline of human evolution and the early spread of modern humans within Africa. When it comes to Homo sapiens fossils, there is an abundant amount of material to study. From the discussed marble cranium in China to the Hofmeyer skull in South Africa, these fossils illuminate the extensive and varied evolutionary journey of Homo sapiens. They reveal a tapestry of physical and cultural adaptations, showcasing our species' remarkable ability to thrive in diverse environments and highlighting the intricate history that has shaped today's modern humans. However, fossils can only tell us so much about a species' anatomy. Luckily, this is our species, and our anatomy is no secret and its history is perhaps the most fascinating to ever exist. When it comes to anatomy, our bodies share many similarities with those of other animals, yet there are distinctive traits that define us as humans. For instance, our dental formula reflects shorter palates and smaller teeth compared to other primates. Notably, we're gradually losing our third molars, and our crowded teeth often close gaps quickly in young individuals. It's no secret that we share some physical features with chimpanzees, such as the vestigial tail and opposable thumbs. However, humans have evolved barrel-shaped chests for bipedal respiration, setting us apart from all our primate relatives. And despite having a similar density of hair follicles, our velus hair, aka peach fuzz, is mostly invisible, as we boast an impressive two million sweat glands across our bodies for thermoregulation. When it comes to height and weight, each human differs wildly. This is because our average height and weight are influenced by our own genetics and the environment. Humans excel in endurance activities like long-distance running, 
Thanks to our efficient sweat glands and our adapted cardiovascular system, this evolutionary trait is no doubt thanks to the species before us, who slowly evolved to become efficient hunters and skilled runners. Our species also has a complex skeletal structure of about 206 bones in our adult bodies, providing support, protection, and movement. Our skeleton is divided into two main parts, the axial skeleton, which includes the skull, vertebral column, and ribcage, and the appendicular skeleton, which includes the limbs and their supporting structures. Moving on from the skeleton, we also have 600 muscles in our bodies, which work together with our skeleton to help us move, maintain posture, and generate heat. Our muscles come in three types. Skeletal muscles, which are attached to bones and help us move voluntarily. Smooth muscles, found in our internal organs and blood vessels, controlling involuntary movements like digestion, and cardiac muscles found in the heart, pumping blood throughout our bodies. This blood is oxygenated through a process called respiration, which is essential for providing oxygen to our cells and removing waste products. During this process, we breathe in oxygen through our nose and mouth, which then travels down our trachea or windpipe and into our lungs. Inside our lungs, the oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide, which we then exhale through our nose and mouth. Moving on to our circulatory system, which includes our heart, blood vessels, and blood. Thanks to evolution, we have a very efficient system, as our hearts pump oxygen-rich blood from the lungs to the rest of our body through arteries, and then return oxygen-poor blood back to the lungs through veins. This continuous circulation ensures that oxygen and nutrients are delivered to our cells, and waste products are removed properly. For energy, our digestive system helps us break down food and absorb nutrients. It includes organs like the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, liver, and pancreas. See, after we swallow food, it's broken down into smaller pieces by enzymes and acids in our stomach and intestines, and then absorbed into our bloodstream to be used by our cells. For cognitive activities, we have the nervous system, which controls all of our body's activities by sending electrical signals between our brain, spinal cord, and nerves. It's divided into two main parts, the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which includes all the nerves that branch out from the spinal cord to the rest of the body. Together, they create a network that allows us to navigate environments and promptly adapt to situations. Finally, our reproductive system allows us to create new life. In males, the reproductive system includes the testes, which produce sperm, and the penis, which delivers sperm to the female reproductive tract. In females, it includes the ovaries, which produce eggs, and the uterus, where a fertilized egg can develop into a baby. In the realm of genetics, our genetic makeup is remarkably similar across individuals, with a 99.5% to 99.9% .9 genetic similarity between any two people. This idea basically means that way back during the late Pleistocene era, there was this period where our human ancestors went through some serious stuff. During this period, environmental factors and geographical events likely played a significant role in shaping human genetic diversity. Essentially, the genetic research has provided compelling evidence of the rich tapestry of human migration and settlement patterns, particularly within African populations. The continent of Africa today is recognized as the cradle of humanity, where our earliest ancestors originated and diversified. Within Africa, diverse ecosystems and geographical features fostered the development of distinct genetic lineages over millions of years. But crazy enough, not all, as the migratory history of African populations reflects a dynamic interplay of environmental pressures, cultural practices, and technological innovations. From the ancient migrations of hunter-gatherer groups to the spread of agricultural communities, humans have continually adapted to changing landscapes and climates. Ancient Homo sapiens, like their modern counterparts, were adaptable creatures, able to thrive in a variety of environments across the globe. They inhabited diverse habitats ranging from lush forests to arid savannas, from coastal regions to mountainous terrain. Essentially, their ability to adapt to different environments was crucial for their survival and expansion as a species. The population of Homo sapiens fluctuated over time, influenced by factors such as food availability, climate change, and competition with other species. Early Homo sapiens lived in small, nomadic groups, relying on hunting and gathering for sustenance. 
as they developed more sophisticated tools and techniques, they were able to expand into new territories and increase their population size. By the Upper Paleolithic period, around 50,000 years ago, Homo sapiens had spread across much of the world, forming larger and more complex societies, which ultimately led to the 8 billion people with whom we share a family. The ancient Homo sapiens faced significant challenges as they adapted to changing environmental conditions. Throughout their history, they experienced periods of dramatic climate change, shifting from ice ages to warmer interglacial periods. These changes impacted their habitats, food sources, and migration patterns. For example, during glacial periods, vast ice sheets covered much of the northern hemisphere, forcing Homo sapiens to migrate south in search of food and shelter. As the climate warmed, they were able to expand into new territories and develop agriculture, leading to the establishment of settled communities. The changing environment also influenced the cultural and technological innovations of ancient Homo sapiens, as they developed specialized tools and techniques for hunting, fishing, and gathering, as well as for building shelters and clothing to protect themselves from the elements. Over time, they learned to harness fire for cooking, warmth, and protection, further enhancing their ability to survive and thrive in diverse environments. Basically, the ancient Homo sapiens were resilient and adaptable beings who successfully navigated changing environments throughout their history. Their ability to innovate, cooperate, and migrate allowed them to spread across the globe and establish diverse and dynamic societies. But to adapt, they needed food. So what did they eat? Sadly, unlike us, the ancient Homo sapiens did not have McDonald's or cereal, but rather a diverse diet based on the resources available. The diet of ancient Homo sapiens was as diverse as the environments they inhabited, reflecting their hunter-gatherer lifestyle and resourceful adaptation to changing conditions. As nomadic foragers, they traversed varied landscapes, from dense forests to open plains, and their diet evolved in response to the seasonal rhythms of nature. Meat was a cornerstone of their sustenance, with ancient Homo sapiens displaying remarkable hunting prowess in pursuit of a diverse array of game. From mammoths to rabbits, they employed a range of hunting techniques, from coordinated group efforts to individual pursuits with spears and bows. The bounty of the hunt provided not only sustenance, but also essential nutrients like protein, fat, and vitamins, sustaining their physical strength and vitality. Yet their diet extended beyond the hunt, encompassing a rich tapestry of plant foods gathered from the land. Fruits, berries, nuts, roots, and leafy greens were among their botanical bounty, harvested with intimate knowledge of local flora and seasonal availability. This gathering aspect of their diet required keen observation and an intimate understanding of the natural world as ancient Homo sapiens navigated the complexities of their environment. Seasonal variation played a significant role in shaping their dietary habits, with ancient Homo sapiens adapting their food sources to the changing rhythms of the seasons. They moved with the ebb and flow of nature, shifting their focus between hunting and gathering to capitalize on seasonal abundance and ensure a sustainable food supply throughout the year. The advent of fire and cooking marked a pivotal movement in human culinary history, transforming raw ingredients into savory meals that not only satisfied hunger, but also enhanced flavor, texture, and nutritional value. Cooking over an open flame not only made food more palatable, but also helped to neutralize harmful bacteria and parasites, mitigating the risk of foodborne illnesses. But that's not all, as social dynamics also influenced their diet, with food sharing and cooperation playing a central role in ancient Homo sapiens society. Within their tight-knit communities, individuals shared resources to ensure everyone had enough to eat, fostering bonds of reciprocity and mutual support. Rituals and ceremonies surrounding food likely served as cultural touchstones, reinforcing social cohesion and identity within their tribes. In essence, the diet of ancient Homo sapiens was a testament to their ingenuity, adaptability, and intimate connection to the natural world. As skilled hunter-gatherers, they thrived on a diverse array of foods procured from their surroundings, embodying a harmonious relationship with the land and its bounty. This relationship would ultimately shape their lifestyle, as it fostered a community that not only relied on the land, but also on each other. Ancient Homo sapiens lived dynamic lifestyles that were shaped by their environment, social interactions, and cultural practices. 
let's delve into the various aspects of their lifestyle. The need to rely on each other gave birth to something more complex than food, as language played a crucial role in ancient Homo sapiens society, enabling communication, cooperation, and the transmission of knowledge and culture across generations. While the specifics of their languages are lost to time, evidence suggests that they developed complex verbal communication systems, likely consisting of spoken language, supplemented by gestures, facial expressions, and possibly early forms of symbolic communication. Over time, this language would evolve and even take the shape of art, as they now left messages for those who would come next. Messages for us. See, artistic expression was a hallmark of ancient Homo sapiens culture, manifesting in a variety of forms, including cave paintings, sculptures, engravings, and decorative objects. These artworks provided insights into their beliefs, experiences, and cultural practices, depicting scenes of daily life, hunting expeditions, ceremonial rituals, and mythical creatures. The intricate craftsmanship and symbolic imagery showcase their creativity, imagination, and spiritual connection to the world around them. The early evidence of art was shell engravings made by Homo erectus 300,000 years before modern humans evolved. However, art attributed to Homo sapiens existed at least 75,000 years ago, with jewelry and drawings found in caves in South Africa. But art isn't only drawing, as evidence of humans engaging in musical activities predates cave art. And so far, Music has been practiced by virtually all known human cultures. Homo would also go on to invent writing, with one of the oldest surviving works of literature being the Epic of Gilgamesh, first engraved on ancient Babylonian tablets about 4,000 years ago. See, unlike speaking, reading, and writing, they do not come naturally to humans and must be taught. Nevertheless, literature was present before the invention of words and language. With 30,000-year-old paintings on walls inside some caves, portraying a series of dramatic scenes. Moving on from the arts, the ancient Homo sapiens were adept toolmakers, crafting a diverse array of implements from stone, bone, wood, and other natural materials. These tools served a multitude of purposes, from hunting and gathering to crafting shelter and processing food. Stone tools such as hand axes, scrapers, and spear points were integral to their survival, allowing them to manipulate their environment and exploit available resources with precision and efficiency. Over time, these tools advanced beyond our wildest imaginations and soon grew enough to where our species has made the world a technological hub designed for our survival. Besides technology, clothing played a vital role in protecting ancient Homo sapiens from the elements, regulating body temperature, and providing camouflage for hunting and gathering activities. While the specifics of their attire varied depending on climate and cultural practices, evidence suggests that they crafted garments from animal hides, plant fibers, and other materials. Additionally, some researchers speculate that ancient Homo sapiens may have utilized natural substances, such as aromatic plants or minerals, as rudimentary forms of deodorant to mask body odors and deter pests. Essentially, they were not so different from their modern counterparts. Unlike no other animal in the world, the ancient Homo sapiens exhibited complex belief systems and spiritual practices encompassing animistic beliefs, ancestor worship, and reverence for natural forces and phenomena. Rituals, ceremonies, and communal gatherings played a central role in their religious observances, fostering social cohesion and reinforcing cultural identity. Today, artifacts such as burial sites, ceremonial objects, and symbolic artifacts provide archaeological evidence of their spiritual beliefs and practices. This belief in a religion would go on to shape the world and its values. It would also go on to shape customs, both big and small, especially customs like burials. See, burial customs varied among ancient Homo sapiens communities, reflecting cultural diversity and regional traditions. Archaeological evidence indicates that they practiced elaborate burial rituals, interring the deceased with grave goods, offerings, and symbolic artifacts. Besides that, burial sites often served as communal gathering places and sacred spaces, where rituals of mourning, remembrance, and reverence were conducted to honor the departed and ensure their transition to the afterlife. Ancient Homo sapiens lived in diverse habitats, ranging from coastal plains and river valleys to mountainous regions and grasslands. They established temporary campsites, seasonal settlements, 
and more permanent dwellings, depending on their subsistence strategies and mobility patterns. Evidence of their settlements, including hearths, tool assemblages, and architectural remains, provide insights into their social organization, technological innovations, and adaptive strategies for survival. They show us today that the lifestyle of ancient Homo sapiens was characterized by innovation, creativity, and resilience as they navigated the challenges and opportunities of their ever-changing world. Their cultural legacy continues to resonate today, offering valuable lessons about human adaptation, cooperation, and the enduring power of creativity and expression. But perhaps the strongest feat of our ancestors was the ability to make a better tomorrow, a trait we still hold on to today, as we pass the torch onto the next generation. But what do you think about the Homo sapiens species? Let us know in the comment section below. And while you're at it, why not hit the like and subscribe button to learn more about the past. Until next time, bye.